so much, Dr. Amy, for joining us today at the ICS Colloquium. Dr. Amy is a professor and informatics program chair at the Information School and also holds a courtesy appointment at Paul G. Allen School of Computer Science and Engineering at University of Washington, Seattle. She completed her honors bachelor's in bachelor's of computer science and psychology at Oregon State University, and her doctorate degree is in human computer interaction at Carnegie Mellon University. Dr. Amy studies individual and collective struggles to understand computing and harness it for equity and justice. With particular interest in helping youth understand the limits of code, data, and machine learning, and empowering educators to teach these limits in inclusive and equitable ways. We are so grateful to have Dr. Amy join us today at the colloquium, and she is an ICS student selected speaker. So all our students look so much into her work for equitable education in STEM spaces and her positionality on social justice. Uh, with this, I'll not take any further more time and give the podium to Dr. Amy to share her amazing work with us. There you go, Dr. Amy, thank you. Great, thanks, Sully. Let's do a quick AV check. Can everybody see my slides and see me and hear me? I see some thumbs up, some virtual oh, ones, some, yep, some physical we're ones. We're good, thank you. Okay, great. I also turned on captioning for those who might need it. Um, so thanks a lot for the invitation to speak, especially um, virtually. It's such a pleasure to stay connected during this pandemic, even though it's sometimes clumsy and brittle through all of this weird infrastructure of the lab. Um, I've given a lot of talks recently, and many of them have been quite personal, kind of telling my story as a trans person in computer science and connecting those experiences to the intersections of computing and justice. But today I'm going to take that theme of computing and justice, and instead of centering on myself and what I think that's meant for some of my scholarship, I want to kind of indulge in a more conventional talk that centers my research. But I'm going to try to do this in an, un an unconventional way. So rather than share a deep summary of two to three research papers and get into the details of methods, um, I want to share with you nearly all of my discoveries from the past 20 years about the central focus of my work, which has largely been about programming. Um, and I'll try to do this in three parts, um, a rapid tour through a synthesis of everything I've learned about programming by studying it as a cognitive act. And then everything that I've learned more recently about programming by studying it as a social and political act. And then I'll try to close by bridging those two different lenses and showing us how these different analytical frames really aren't as far apart as we think. So I want to recognize um, that in this audience, right, this is an Institute of Cognitive Science, there might not be a lot of you that feel passionately about programming or think that it's particularly an interesting or necessary thing to study. So why study programming? Well, if it were the 1950s, it'd actually be a really hard case to make. Computers filled rooms, there were only five of them, they were largely programmed by low-wage women mathematicians and science and government. And while they played pivotal roles in wars and business, they were still relatively niche things. We didn't have a lot of reason to understand programming as a broader phenomenon. Now, of course, computing is everywhere, um, in our pockets, in our homes, in our cars and trains and planes, on our bodies, in our bodies, and even in the invisible infrastructure that we rarely consider, whether that's energy, trade, law, justice, politics. All of these systems exist because of this one activity, programming which involves conceiving of some computational behavior that we want a computer to do in the future, and then carefully and sometimes not so carefully trying to translate that behavior into logic, into calculation and structure and process. So how and what we program has never really been more central in shaping society than it is today. So who does it, how quickly they do it, how carefully they do it, how thoughtfully they do it, and how inclusively they do it, no longer just shapes government and science, but nearly every dimension of our lives. Uh, it shapes who gets loans, who goes to jail and for how long, who eats, who thrives, who dies sometimes. And so understanding how people do it and why it's hard and why we continue to make some of the same mistakes after 70 years of, of programming digital computers, these are qu questions of great consequence. So my own curiosity about programming began when I was 13 in middle school. Um, I first learned about programming in the seventh grade in a pre-algebra class when our teacher taught us how to write simple programs on our TI-82 graphing calculators. 
I found ways to create games and procedural art and found it an incredibly fun and hard and satisfying and social way to express myself. Uh, this is a photograph of my friends in our computer art club in, our, in a yearbook, which was just as much about art and computers as it was about using code and writing code. Um, when I got to college, though, I got more interested in, in what programming is and how people do it and stumbled into research. I first studied people programming spreadsheets for finance and simulation and grading, focusing on how they test and debug their formulas or more often don't do those things. I expanded my focus to professional software developers working alone in teams at companies, big and small, and to creative professionals harnessing obscure programming languages to create interactive games and digital music and art. Um, I also studied students learning to code in and out of school. And now I even study primary, secondary, and post-secondary um, teachers learning to program and learning to teach programming in their classrooms. And throughout all of this, I've examined it largely from a distributed cognition lens, considering not only what is happening in people's minds when they're programming, but also what's happening on their screens, on the websites they visit, in the tools that they use, in the communities that they engage with, and how all of these interact to produce programs and defects in programs. But over the past several years, I've also begun to examine it from a social cognition lens, investigating how people make software, how people who make software think and reason about who they're making it for, and how they reason about the broader social impacts of what they're making, as well as how they project and signal who deserves to program and who is welcome in their communities from a cultural perspective. And so that brings me to this dichotomy in the title of this talk, Programming as Cognition, Programming as Politics. These are the two lenses that dominate how I think about programming and that I hope to bridge by the end of this talk. Um, but before we dive in, I want to give just a few disclaimers since this is a relatively unconventional research talk. Um, one is on prior work. Um, I'm not the only one who studied programming. This work began in the early 1980s when psychologists and computer scientists came together to study the dominant way that people interacted with computers in the 70s and 80s by writing programs. This was before the graphical user interface was ubiquitous. Um, research on the psychology of programming began in about 1980 when I was zero years old. Everything I'm about to present really builds on that rich history of studies and theories. Um, however, much of my work, much of this work in the 80s stopped in the mid 90s when everybody shifted their attention to the internet. Um, and so I started studying programming around 2000 when people started coming back to some of these topics they'd abandoned. And I was one of the people that helped reboot discourse with new methods and theories perspectives to understand programming as a phenomenon. So I'll focus on my own work in this talk, but just remember that it builds directly upon a whole um, host of different discoveries from the past 40 years. Second, there's a methods disclaimer to read here. Um, this is going to be a broad talk. I won't spend much time detailing methods, sample sizes, measurements, or other details. Everything I present is peer reviewed and may have been, and many have been successfully replicated. Um, I tend to use mixed methods, um, lab and field experiments that combine qualitative data with log and artifact analysis, um, and sometimes doing theoretical work as well. So there's a lot of different types of scholarship that I do here, but I won't really get into the details of the nature of each of these contributions. Another one is collaboration. Um, I've done all of this work with an amazing group of collaborators, doctoral students, undergraduates, practitioners in industry. They all deserve just as much credit for this as I do for these discoveries. So keep all of these faces in mind when you're thinking about all of these discoveries I'm about to share. And then lastly, I'm not gonna talk about my work in order. Um, my theories and hypotheses about programming, they really span two decades of interleaved ideas and they didn't happen in a tidy order, just like no science does. Um, so I'll try to simplify this history and put it in an order that makes the theory salient over the sequence of the discoveries that I made. So with that, let's start with what I've learned from a cognitive perspective. Um, and I'll jump right in with one study, which really investigated this difference between reading and writing code and trying to understand in what ways they're distinct skills. Um, most people learn to code by writing a lot of code and learning from failures as they make it. Um, however, it's not clear that this is the most efficient way to learn um, a programming language. So we experimentally examined two ways of sequencing learning, writing programs and then getting a lot of feedback on them, or learning to read programs really well and getting feedback on that reading, and then learning to write them with feedback. So really just sequencing and separating those two different activities. 
And we found that learning to read first significantly improved the quality of practice and the depth of understanding in programs that students were writing and error rates um, dropped as well. And in doing this, we distinguished between tasks that involved reading the um, line by line behavior of programs versus reading the larger templates of design patterns that some program achieved. Um, and the distinguishing between reading and writing of those two things. So this two by two table summarizes those four distinct skills. So what we've specifically found is that sequencing learning by these four skills, focusing on low level reading, low level writing, and then higher level template and design pattern reading, and then um, higher level um, template writing, this significantly improves learning across all of these dimensions. There's a bad rap. So language learning, we also found, requires really granular interactivity. That's the hidden word there under, the, under that slide. Um, when we really drill down into that first quadrant of reading code, um, we learn something else. And that's that many people learn a programming language by slowly inferring its semantics, the rules that govern how a program executes, slowly inferring them through trial and error. Um, but many struggle in trying to do this type of inferential learning and develop really brittle, inaccurate understandings of how a language executes code. And they often quit as a result out of frustration. So we tried teaching languages with really granular interactive examples that map the specific syntax of part of a programming language um, onto the rules that govern how it executes, um, and really trying to provide very low level concrete examples of this. Um, and then formatively assessing that knowledge um, occasionally as part of this instruction. And we found somewhat surprisingly that in just three or four hours of this kind of very granular interactive um, practice, students um, outperformed students who'd spent six, six weeks in formal classroom learning in an introductory programming class. Um, so here, what this reveals, um, if you look at this, uh, this example on the left of this intervention, the programming language tutor that we built, that really it's the interactivity around these ideas and the way that they're taught that is shaping how effectively they're learned. It kind of suggests that difficulties with reading code and learning to code in general, they're much more dominated by sort of inaccessible, um, sort of invisible insights about how programs execute that are never really taught in a lecture or never really seen when you're executing a program and not seeing it execute at that very low level grant of granularity. So in other words, we've just been teaching them poorly, right? It might be that we can actually teach these things much more quickly than we think. We looked at reading more closely from a strategic perspective as well, as well and that revealed another dimension. Um, code reading is active and distributed. Um, even when separating reading from writing, learners really vary in their effectiveness of how well they read code. So we tried scaffolding reading by providing an explicit step-by-step -step reading process and structured format for externalizing, externalizing state like the values of variables. And in an experiment, we found that students in the treatment group were more systematic, made fewer errors, and scored a higher grade level, a greater level higher on their midterm than students that didn't receive this really basic scaffolding. And when I say it's basic, I mean exceedingly basic. There were maybe five um, steps of instructions for them to follow, and this worksheet, that's all we gave them. So you can see just through this basic kind of externalization and scaffolding um, dramatic improvements in their strategic approach to thinking about how to read code. So that's reading, and that's something that we really learned is that it's a distinct skill, it has to be taught separately, and when you teach it separately, it really helps. But when we turn our attention to writing, we see very different skills. Um, one approach we looked at was considering it from an error perspective. Um, we found that errors ultimately emerge from a variety of um, interactions between skills and, and cognitive biases and the tools that um, people use when they're writing code. So I adapted a lot of research on human error to programming and empirically examined error production across hundreds of hours of um, video footage of programming, looking at the root causes of some of the mistakes that people made when they were making errors when they were writing code whether and when people noticed the errors they made was largely a function of their tool environment and their practices around verification. And these generally failed to reveal errors when people made them and that's how they didn't notice them. And then there were of course biases, right? They were, um, when people were debugging and doing a diagnosis of something that was wrong, it often suffered from a recency bias. It must be something that I just changed even though it might've been something they changed weeks ago or action bias, right? Rather than um, carefully understanding what the program was doing, a lot of people would try to diagnose um, the behavior of the program by 
modifying it, which would only sometimes introduce more defects in the process. So again, strategy here was a really central theme of people not thinking about their process very carefully. And as a result, um, not noticing errors they were making and not being able to find the errors once they'd made them. The diagram on the left shows an example of a root cause analysis of one error example, where there was a series of false assumptions that led to a misinterpretation of somebody uh, of the output that a program had produced. And that led to a false hypothesis that um, somebody then spent an hour trying to investigate. And that led to some change that was incorrect, which led to another error and so on. So this pattern of interactions between sort of beliefs that people have about a program and the, and the information tools are exposing, these are the dynamics of where defects come from. When we look more closely at debugging, um, we found that it's generally driven by hypothesis testing. Um, to find errors, most people kind of haphazardly generate hypotheses about errors based on superficial features of the failure that they observe. And then they spend most of their time testing and rejecting those false hypotheses about the program's behavior. So we predicted that we could circumvent this sort of vicious cycle by inverting the process, um, having people work backwards from the failure, doing root cause analysis, rather than sort of guessing their way forwards to the ultimate failure. And across a range of tasks, we found that we, when we gave them this tool that helped them work backwards, um, this reduced debugging time by anywhere from a factor of two to 10 for similar tasks, um, and by basically eliminating fruitless hypotheses from people's search process. Um, so this tool that I show here on the right, I won't go into it in detail, this is part of my dissertation work long ago, is basically would let somebody point to some of the program output that um, they knew was wrong, and then the tool would automatically generate a series of events that had happened when the program executed that caused that wrong output to occur. One of the more striking qualitative observations from this work was how shocked some of the more experienced programmers were at its simplicity. They said, I don't think I can ever go back to the way I used to debug, but I have to because there aren't tools like this and I don't know how to do it on my own. So yet again, it sort of illustrates the importance of this distributed, um, distributed cognition perspective on debugging. It's not something that developers do just in their minds. It's very much an interaction between them and what tools they have available. When we looked at all of these efforts to sort of intervene and try to make debugging and reading and writing more successful, there was something that we noticed, which was that whether or not people paid attention to the information that some tool was giving them seemed to be a really important factor in whether or not they changed their behavior. Um, so here's an example. It seemed that how are these interventions presented information greatly determined um, whether they paid attention to it and thus how much that inf information influenced their behavior. So we compared really conventional um, tool error messages, um, things with impersonal and technical language, kind of like this example here, syntax error, SCN is an unrecognized command, um, to more um, personal messages that were anthropomorphized um, in some way. So here's another example of a little robot saying, hmm, SCN isn't one of the commands I know, I'm just gonna skip this step. So giving um, these features, and in particular, we experimented with things like giving the compiler an, um, eyes or having compilers use personal pronouns in their error messages, or representing data even with um, vertebrates instead of um, sort of inanimate objects, significantly increased how much people paid attention to these messages, which increased learning outcomes and decreased debugging time over all of these other more inanimate and impersonal forms of guiding attention. So even with all of these fancy tools and even with better strategies, it turns out that regulating what developers and programmers are looking at is a really central part of ensuring that they are successful. So while we found that reading was largely dominated by people's ability to carefully and precisely attend to the right information and do that in the right order, our examination of writing revealed something really different. Um, in one of my earliest studies, for example, I found that writing was much less a process of careful reasoning and much more a process of carefully reusing what others had written. Um, so mine was one of the first studies that looked at API usage. Um, I spent 15 weeks um, over a period of a semester watching a group of students do application development and found that what made programming hard for them despite their experience with programming languages and other things was um, more than just learning languages and doing debugging. It was about finding, learning and evaluating and coordinating code that others had built into libraries, APIs and other types of projects. 
and that a lack of information about all of this reusable code often posed really insurmountable barriers to them constructing what, the, they, what they wanted. Um, so this diagram on the right shows the common pattern that we observed in this work. Someone would try to use some code that they found that they wanted to reuse. They would make a series of assumptions about its behavior for lack of information about its behavior and then reach some barrier caused by those assumptions. And then the only thing that would help them overcome it is if they could find the right information about that code um, that corrected that assumption. But it was rare that the tools, documentation, or other resources ever helped reveal or check those assumptions. In fact, resources tended to make numerous assumptions about um, the expertise of the person reading those resources themselves. So in some sense, it's like one big macro scale miscommunication between API designers and API users. We've looked at um, this reuse activity a lot more closely recently, and um, when we considered it more directly, we found that most of reuse is about comprehending these models that others have designed into libraries and APIs. And so we've developed this theory that argues that learning APIs really boils down to three essential types of knowledge that people need, as portrayed on the left. There are one, domain concepts, right? Imagine you're using an API, for example, that's doing, let's say, image analysis. You need to understand what image analysis is, and you need to understand how an API models image analysis to be able to successfully use an image analysis API. And most of the documentation in the world just sort of ignores this basic knowledge requirement of trying to understand some existing API. Two, you have to understand how the API executes things, right? These are other programs that have um, some behavior that um, if you don't understand how that behavior works, you're not gonna be able to harness it in a way that's correct or um, achieves whatever goals you might have. And then third, um, all APIs have some intended use around them. And that intended use is also not um, frequently not documented. In fact, websites like Stack Overflow, which often aggregate um, uh, usage patterns for APIs, it's often described as sort of missing documentation, right? This is what the API designers should have made clear, but they didn't make clear. So the community had to come together and write it. Um, so documentation, of course, is missing a lot of these things. It rarely makes um, any of the domain knowledge visible or teachable, um, and it rarely makes any declarative facts about the execution of semantics of the API visible. Um, and so we showed in an experiment that if you make all of these visible and available, it actually does help um, learning quite a bit and people can successfully use APIs more successfully, but there's a lot of information, so it's pretty overwhelming. So in essence, learning to use others' code seems to mirror some of the challenges of understanding your own code, um, but both require a really careful, precise understanding of how programs execute. And that when that precise understanding isn't available, that's when people make mistakes. Um, and that's when people have to find some more, um, more precise mental model of what's going on when the program executes. We also looked at reuse in the context of larger teams of developers working together to build larger projects. So um, through a three month field study of professional software developers, this was at Microsoft um, back in 2006, we found that most of their time on the job was spent seeking information from resources, whether documentation or other developers, and that if they couldn't find the information for some of these um, uh, things we talked about in the previous slide, they often had to abandon some tasks. I watched countless developers go and do two or three hours of research on some bug that they were trying to fix. And it turned out the knowledge they needed was from an engineer who had left the company two years ago. And without that knowledge, there was no way they could ever fix the bug. So this was a common pattern. And yet few of the strategies that developers used were effective because most of the systems they used were not designed for information retrieval. Um, the documentation wasn't good, easy to search. They couldn't easily find the developer they needed to talk to. And so most of the people they consulted didn't have um, well-organized information that they could use to get the information that they needed. So if you're ever wondering why Microsoft isn't releasing a patch as quickly as you want, or the next version of Windows as quickly as you want, it's because the nature of this information work in software engineering practice is fundamentally about um, trying to bring together information from a large distributed system of knowledge that's often not brought together. And so this study showed that whether novice or expert, the problems are the same. Understanding program behavior is central to fixing it and changing it. Experts just had more careful and systematic strategies for doing it that tried to compensate for the increased complexity of that task. 
We considered some other kinds of information seeking as well. Um, and for example, one common type of information I'm gathering that programmers have to do is from users of software, right? The people that are executing the programs that they're building. And users are often reporting defects or problems with programs. But we found that a lot of this information from this broader community um, is of limited value. Um, we studied about 100,000 bug reports in the open source Mozilla Firefox project and found that extracting meaningful signal from community contributions, if there is any signal at all, is often so time consuming that it's often ignored. Instead, most of the meaningful information came from core developers on the project who had deep knowledge of how the browser was built. And this created a lot of outrage amongst people who'd spend a lot of time to try to share this information with teams. Um, and here's an example quote from one contributor of one, of one bug. Um, over two months ago, I gave complete information on when and how I get the error and spent a great deal of time isolating the messages that caused it. Which part of that is just saying me too? For crying out loud, I'm a nursing student, not a programmer. Do you do your own x-rays before going to the doctor? So here's an example of sort of a much larger macro scale level um, uh, distributed task of trying to understand the behavior of one aspect of a program across hundreds or thousands of people and just not being able to get the information from those thousands of people into a form that lets people diagnose and fix some problem. As we considered information seeking more broadly, um, we found that much of the need for information emerged not from inherent complexities and programs themselves, but from the social and organizational context of the teams that maintain them. Um, so for example, in a study of more than 3000 developers perceptions of programming expertise, um, we found that programming was about more than just languages, tools, debugging and reuse of information. Um, it was actually more than 50 attributes that developers viewed as essential characteristics of being a great software engineer. Uh, personality characteristics, decision-making skills, interpersonal teamwork skills, product management skills. Um, the diagram on the left shows about 53 of these attributes that they identified and that little tiny box in the bottom right, that's the box that's about programming. Everything else was about higher level decision-making skills and how they interact with the broader social context of teams and organizations. Sorry, my slides are no longer advancing. All right, so we followed up on some of this expertise work, expertise work and, and asked hundreds of developers um, to rank the importance of these different skills. And this was across multiple companies. We kind of expected programming skills to be central in terms of um, what developers thought were the most important skills. But to our surprise, um, it was, you know, was number one, but most of the other must have skills that developers shared in their ranking were not programming skills at all, but rather self-regulation skills, um, systematic attention to detail and code, metacognition about skills and context, proactive efforts to correct conceptions, awareness of when to analyze versus when to act, the ability to manage time, tasks, and resources, all of these painted a picture of programming as an act of cognitive self-control, right? Always monitoring what you need, how problem solving is proceeding and when information and comprehension is sufficient to take action and when it's not and you need more information to, to gather. But when we looked at self-regulation more closely, we found that it's actually quite rare. Um, we empirically examined the planning and process monitoring, comprehension monitoring, reflection on cognition and self-explanation of several novice programmers and found that planning, process monitoring and comprehension monitoring were really strongly anti-correlated with errors and learning outcomes. The more they did them, the less those um, errors happened. Um, and the less they did them, the more errors happened. And in general, all of these activities were infrequent. And so this frequency kind of explained most of the variation in programming skill. So the professional's instincts um, were right. Self-control and problem solving when programming was one of the single most important factors in success. But we also found that self-regulation is hard and that might be why it's rare. Um, we tried an experiment where we had several dozen students attempt to purposefully self-regulate in work diaries but nearly all reported significant difficulties. Um, some were completely unaware of their process or their decisions. Um, some struggled to integrate reflection into their processes. They wouldn't, didn't feel like they could interrupt themselves to do this thinking. 
Some found reflection distracting or perceived that it interfered with their progress. Um, here are a couple of quotes. Um, when I hit really difficult bugs, I don't want to reflect on them or journal. I just want to look at my code and chase them down. Or it was really difficult to remove myself from my workflow and constantly having to switch between my journal and my code. It broke my workflow and made me slower. Um, these are really interesting because in some of the prior studies I've described or with professionals, these journaling activities, these are exactly what professionals find that they have to do in order to be successful. They have to be methodical. They have to slow down. They have to reflect on their activities and that's what makes them successful. So here there's a clear skill gap here and a clear um, question around what is authentic practice, right? From the student's perspective, it's writing a solution as quickly as possible and never stopping to think about it. Um, but from professionals' perspective, it was doing the exact opposite, being very slow, very methodical, very careful, and writing extensively about your process. One of our attempts to help scaffold self-regulation was promising. Um, we wanted to try to teach these skills and fill this gap. Um, in a classroom of adolescents, for example, we offered a step-by-step -step programming strategy that scaffolded um, help with some of the harder tasks in programming, like planning an algorithm or debugging a defect. We would give them step-by-step -step guidance about how to proceed on this problem solving and check in on their progress along the way. And students had some really interesting and conflicting um, experiences. Some believed that strategies were helpful and tried to follow the strategies, um, but could explicitly tell us that they succumbed to the inability to control their impulses, right? They would tell us, I know I should do this. I know it's helpful, but I just can't help myself. I just need to try this shortcut. Um, and then they would always report at the end, regretting following their impulses and eventually having to come back to the strategy to be systematic to solve their problem. And so the screenshot on the left shows the tool that we gave them to help track and regulate their progress. Um, and while we found that the strategies we gave them were reliably successful, and these externalizations did help them track their problem solving, ultimately students only ever use them slowly and begrudgingly after accepting that their impulsive and uninformed and haphazard strategies were just not working. So here, lots of friction in trying to teach these skills and learn them. We did have a slightly more successful attempt at scaffolding self-regulation by um, orchestrating it in different ways. Um, instead, tried scaffolding it by promoting reflection during help seeking. So each time a student asked for help, we asked the student, what are you doing? Why are you doing it? Is it helping? What could you do differently? And over two weeks, they eventually started asking these questions of themselves and were more successful, independent, and confident than students in a control group who didn't receive these reflection prompts. One of the most exciting findings here too was actually that we unfortunately replicated in the control group um, an erosion of growth mindset over time amongst that group that did not receive this intervention. But in the group that was receiving this self-regulation scaffolding, they actually um, increased and strengthened their, their um, growth mindset around um, all skills, not just programming. So what seemed to work better about this approach was actually a psychological effect. Um, students quickly gained a sense of independence and confidence when they no longer needed to ask for help. And that promoted self-regulation practice, which developed skills in programming. And that was a self-reinforcing dynamic for the broader um, activity that they were engaged in. Now, despite all of this work that demonstrated the importance of self-regulation and getting good information and being thoughtful about when you get information versus act, no matter how carefully somebody reads or writes code or how thoughtfully they regulate their attention, we've found through a series of studies that the dominant factor in success is much more strategic than cognitive. Um, so here's an example. We experimented with a set of explicit expert programming strategies um, that we knew were effective strategies and found that when um, people use those strategies for solving various programming tasks, instead of their own inherent strategies that they built on, the, on their own, they were significantly more successful independent of their skills. In fact, we found that um, novices who had no experience and no good strategies who used these expert strategies that were explicitly step-by-step um, -step listed, they did better than experts who did not use those strategies. And so here there's this sort of weird paradox of, is there even a notion here of expertise in programming or is it really just about choosing the right strategies for solving a problem? Um, here's what one expert said. They said, I don't typically do the due diligence of reading all of the variable names and function names when I'm dealing with this sort of thing. 
And it seemed pretty clear to me that this is a really good idea. Um, because one thing I noticed was that my initial instinct was to try to really close to read the flow of the program. And then when I remembered that the task was actually to just read the variable names and function names, I was able to get through it much faster. I still had a pretty good idea of actually how it worked without getting quite in as detail with the rest of the flow. So when they followed strategies known to be effective, they were more successful. Self-regulation was still a critical skill, but that was more in getting them to commit to this known um, effective strategy that experts use. Okay, sorry, slides froze. So what is programming from these cognitive perspectives? Um, you might summarize it this way. It's a social distributed and cognitively immersive form of surgical sculpting with logic, structure, and data that requires really frequent learning, reasoning, externalization about program execution, immense persistence, patience, precision, and growth mindset, and a robust capacity for self-regulation and metacognition, cognitively, socially, and organizationally. So when we look at it that way, it's no wonder that it's hard to learn and teach, right? This is a, this is a challenging collection of skills. Um, and so we can then turn to it and say, you know, well, what does this mean for practice? What does this mean for teaching? What does this mean for um, the world? Well, one reflection is that I'm proud of our work on programming. It's been highly impactful. It's shaped developer tools and curriculum and software engineering methods, and even hiring practices in the software industry. So I, I think it's good work. Um, but there was always something that's bothered me about it. It's never really considered, for example, what people program or why they program it. These things matter immensely, even in low level decisions about how programs are constructed. And yet too often they are afterthoughts when people write code. So that brings me to my second topic, programming is politics. I first started thinking about this more intentionally when I finally accepted that I was transgender about five years ago. My every attempt to live in a digital world started breaking. Databases were designed in ways that prevented me from changing my name. Doctors made medical errors because data schemas couldn't accurately encode my anatomy and physiology. Automated marketing platforms constantly deadnamed me and continue to and give me no power to stop them. It was hard to see software as anything but a tool of capitalism designed for the cisgender majority at my expense. And so I began to ask other questions. Um, how is it that this fascinating skill of programming that's dominated my research for so long so often leads to my oppression, the oppression of my communities, and so many other marginalized groups? Where does that come from inside this technical skill? And so building on countless works from those that came before me, here's what I've learned so far. One, CS education and the way that we teach it and talk about it and conceive of it in the world is usually framed apolitically. Um, I wrote a critique of, of the whole discipline arguing that its apolitical stance is harmful because it ignores the complicit, complicity of algorithms and data and software developers in amplifying systems of oppression and even creating new ones. Um, I called for educators and researchers to begin examining the limits of data and computation and the responsibility of programmers and to explore how to teach these limits and responsibilities to future generations of engineers. And so then I got to work on trying to answer this call with students in my lab. Um, one place we started was trying to understand the misplaced faith in the authority of code. Um, and we found that it requires exposure. Um, many people, especially um, children perceive computers and software as magical, authoritative, and willfully grant them power over their lives and their communities. So why do they do that? When we engage several dozen youth in a creative application of really simple machine learned programs over the course of several weeks, we found that their perceptions of machine intelligence rapidly shifted from unquestioned faith in computers to, an, um, to them as sort of skeptical um, for sources of intelligence with severe limits. And so this suggests that even really basic kinds of exposure to computing education and understanding what it means to construct software can really change some of these ubiquitous perspectives of machines as these intelligent authoritative beings. So this faith is brittle, right? Even a little bit of programming breaks the spell quite quickly. We also found that how well somebody understands what computers do and how they function, um, it's very mediated by egocentricity in how it's taught. So um, we uh, have a tutorial here, for example, that varied only in whether learners were using generic data sets or data from their own lives. 
And we experimentally compared this and found that personal data sets were far superior at promoting learning um, of these concepts in machine learning, but also um, in near transfer tasks to model analysis of, is this a good model? What makes it good or bad? And far transfer into machine learning advocacy tasks where students were writing to advocate for some change in some application of machine learning too. So just the very act of taking data from your own world and saying, here's what I think um, these concepts in an abstract and technical sense mean um, was much more effective than just taking um, given data sets from the world. So not surprising, right? Centering people's own lived experiences when learning about computation leads to better learning. This is what cultural responsiveness means. Now, design and development are another interesting and fascinating thing. Um, dispelling myths about programming is one thing, but helping people understand what programming is and isn't is also critical. So in particular, we observed that this distinction between deciding what software should do, which is how we typically conceive of design, and deciding how to build it, this is what development and programming is, that these are often conflated. Um, we analyzed several national curricula and found that most conflated these two skills and framed programming as a form of design where you're really deciding what to make. But then of course, in these curricula, they only ever taught development. They never taught design um, and design skills. So professional software developers are often portrayed as doing both and often do both in reality because people give them that power, right? So in some essence, if we think about it from a curricular perspective, it's an irresponsible power grab, right? If programming is also designed, but then we don't teach people to design purposefully and we tell everybody in the world that programming is design, we're essentially just handing that power to programmers without the skills to actually do the design work. We've also found that who learns and participates in those design decisions as programmers is largely shaped by stereotypes and stigma. Um, and it's highly skewed towards those at the top of our social hierarchies. Um, I solicited several dozen code autobiographies from students who did not succeed in learning to code. And their lifetime experiences revealed that first encounters are often inaccessible, unsupported, and stigmatized. Mentorship was a critical factor in building resilience um, to programming difficulties. Toxic computer science cultures could quickly erase an entire lifetime of positive experiences. So one bad teacher in college, despite a whole lifetime of great teachers in K-12 could break everything. Here's one quote. Um, this carried me through high school into college where my love of programming has been brutally murdered by out of control CS monsters. I said earlier that my love of the subject matter was inspired through socialization. Well, many of the people I've met in the CS major have graded on my nerves like a cheese grater. They are possibly the most proud people I've ever met. Industry perpetuates some of these toxic cultures in their retraining efforts. For example, um, we interviewed dozens of adults, mostly women of color, who pursued coding boot camps to pivot into software development careers. They reported similar issues as students entering higher education CS learning contexts, but also faced things like stigma from family for doing the career pivot. Um, heavy financial burdens to subsidize their own tuition for the boot camps, lost relationships due to some of the toxic work life culture um, issues in boot camps and industry, humiliation from instructors and peers for not understanding things as quickly as the instructors expected. Most quit and failed to get a job through some of these pivots through boot camps. Some of these negative encounters, of course, are structural barriers imposed by corporations and capitalism, which have committed to some myths of meritocracy tied to proxy indicators of programming, like puzzles or gender or where somebody graduated. All of these students encountered all of these systems when trying to make that pivot from one career to software engineering. We saw similar disregard for students of color transferring to our own institution at the University of Washington to study computer science. Um, we looked at hundreds of students who transferred from two-year colleges to our university. Most struggled to earn comparable grades to their native peers, as this literature tends to call them, but attributed those differences to things like longer commutes, greater caregiving responsibilities, being excluded from study groups due to age or availability, lack of a faculty awareness of um, accommodation and inequities. Um, here's one student that said, I feel like there's a big culture of people working together to understand material. In some ways, I feel like that's a good thing. And in other ways, I feel like that's not really fair to a lot of students. If you work by yourself, you don't understand as much as if you work with other students. And if you commute, you can't work with other students. <laughs> 
And so the broader context of learning disregards differences in resources and capacity to learn, really only supporting students who have everything they need. <clears throat> We've also found some of the same disregard in more subtle places, like in assessments of CS knowledge. Um, in a series of studies, including one on a corpus of 140,000 responses from 20,000 students across the US um, as part of the code.org curriculum, We've used this uh, battery of psychometric techniques to examine bias in programming assessments and have found that many items have systematic bias against women and marginalized racial groups. Which items have bias is often unpredictable and often unexplainable by the people who design the assessments. And that psychometrics analyses themselves require some insurmountable expertise for these assessment designers to interpret and comprehend, really limiting their action ability as methods for detecting bias. So these plots on the right show some of the gender differences that we found. Um, the designers uh, didn't really know how to interpret any of these graphs, didn't really know what any of them meant, didn't really know what they needed to change about their assessment items to prevent this bias from happening, and often just defaulted to more summative ways of objectively measuring merit, um, and ended up excluding people um, through the structural means when they didn't really understand these low-level um, other forms of bias. Now, mentorship um, was another thing that we looked at. Um, teaching sort of ignores um, politics at the expense of learning, but um, mentorship was a way of sort of counteracting this. Um, across two summer high school programming courses, we examined the social networks of students who had learned to code, finding um, a rich diversity of informal mentoring relationships. Uh, mentors were teachers, they were friends, they were siblings. Having an informal mentor um, increased um, in interest in programming after taking a course. Students who shared the identity of the instructors of these courses had higher interest in code after taking the course and viewed her as a role model. And um, in, in many ways, having a mentor was not enough to help the, these broader things. Um, when students were trying to persist, um, they encountered exclusionary and toxic learning communities. Mentorship was not quite enough to help them continue. And so mentorship can help a little bit, right? Um, teaching programming as a political act helped even more though. Um, we just completed a study over this past summer where we taught a course to marginalized youth of color. And rather than focus purely on technical aspects of programming, we focused on the socio-political aspects of programming, how it is used, for example, to create and reinforce systems of oppression and broader, broader society. Students reported leaving the class with an entire community of peers with a shared mission of harnessing code for justice. Um, it was in some way a way of creating community out of some of these shared concerns around computing. One student said, I think a key to reducing inequalities of like AI is by reducing inequalities everywhere else first, because ultimately it's humans designing all of these digital systems and basing all of their data sets and machine learning off of existing human systems. So without first breaking down the human systems that cause inequality, we'll always be producing machines that reinforce that. Unfortunately, when you bring white kids into the picture, the resistance to some of this kinds of teaching is strong. Um, we revised a required CS course in, in our CS degree on computer architecture. This is sort of the hardware software interface course. And we tried to link um, in this course, the history of decisions underlying computer hardware and operating systems to all of the contexts in which they were shaped. Um, world wars, wars on drugs, anti-black policing projects, corporate monopolies, neoliberalism. All of the students uh, expressed surprising and newfound awareness of the historical social context of the construction of these ideas in CS. And marginalized students in the class resonated with the links to oppression and justice. But some of the students from dominant groups found it to be distracting and irrelevant. Um, others worked hard to integrate it into their sense of self. So here's an Asian woman, for example. She said, as a CS-minded person who believes in efficiency more than anything else, this unit alters my mind. And here's a white man, in contrast, who said, everything I'm learning in this course is excellent, but the socio-technical content is boring and unnecessary. So when we look and kind of reflect on some of these recent findings, what is programming politically? Well, in some ways, it's hard to avoid the fact that it's mostly white and Asian men making harmful design choices about how our digital systems should work, often from a place of ignorance or disregard of the diversity of human values and experiences in the world, and with a commitment often to the exploitative, extractive, normative, capitalist, meritocratic goals of efficiency, convenience, and profit.
And so faculty, students, and professionals from these dominant groups, they're often systematically excluding others as part of sort of sustaining their communities and often resist any change in culture or curriculum that might threaten the status quo. And so it's easy to see these two threads of scholarship as sort of irreconcilable. So I kind of want to wrap up by trying to bring them together. Um, one, the one that I started with, paints a picture of a very hard cognitive task that's completely agnostic to who is doing it and what they're doing it for. That account of programming might view anyone who succeeds at learning to program as demonstrating great merit and overcoming great odds. And it's generally how scientists have treated it, including me for most of my career. But lurking beneath that narrative about that phenomenon is often a darker assumption. It's that there's something inherent, intrinsic, or natural about a predisposition to program successfully, and that it's determined by personality or even gender. And so when we take an only cognitive view, even a socially distributed cognitive view of programming, it really ignores the broader cultural and political forces at play in this increasingly critical and contested skill. Um, the sociopolitical view of programming simply examines and acknowledges these forces. It accepts that programming is hard. It also says that it's made much harder for marginalized groups by both explicit and implicit choices by dominant groups to exclude them. And it's made harder by refusing to allow for programming to be viewed as anything but a strictly cognitive activity. And so this reconciliation then to me doesn't seem like such a difficult task. Here's a few things that I think it takes. We have to accept that programming is both political, cognitive and political at the same time. Treating them as a dichotomy is unhelpful and incorrect. Programming is both, and it can and should be taught, discussed, and performed accordingly. It's not currently. We have to examine the interactions between the cognitive and political in programming as an activity. That means examining ideas from critical race theory, which imply that racist and sexist and ableist and transphobic ideas and outcomes are encoded into computer programs just as they are into law. So what does it mean to teach computer science in that way? We have to begin to examine what we might call a kind of political cognition as a central part of programming skill. When somebody is writing a line of code, how do we help them reason about it in political terms in addition to technical terms and weave that into the other more strictly technical and cognitive challenges of programming as an activity? Um, my lab is just beginning to explore these in a new book um, coming out December 6th, Critically Conscious Computing, which we'll be releasing soon. Um, the primary audience here is secondary and post-secondary educators, but it tries to do three things. It makes a case for CS education, not just as a pathway for good paying jobs or a means to personal expression, but as one of the most important fronts in preserving democratic norms and institutions through society. It teaches foundations of CS in socio-technical and socio-political terms. For example, it doesn't just explain the syntax and semantics of an if statement, but also the social and political consequences of if statements when deployed into the world. And it offers new teaching methods for teaching CS in these terms, building on Freire's notion of dialogic teaching, which centers discourse aimed at helping students recognizing their limiting situations in society and their power to organize and act against um, them. Code, after all, isn't just a tool for those with power, but also a tool for the powerless. So we'll launch this on December 6th. The book is free, it's built for the web, and will be a living document that evolves with your feedback. Thank you so much for your time and attention. Um, here are some of the key takeaways from the talk and I'd be happy to take any questions. Oh, thank you for the emoji. Michael, the book will be out on December 6th. So I'll have a link on, on that day. That's the first day of CS Ed Week. Did you say in the chat the, go ahead, Tammy. I was just going to say, Amy, you know, how to say this. In any university department, change is hard. Faculty have entrenched views of their discipline that they've honed over the course of their lifetime. How? You know, and I'll, I am in the computer science department. So how, how do we go about sort of promoting change from within? 
I love this question. And it's something that um, you might not be surprised to hear that I get mostly from students, right? Very rarely from faculty. Um, and what I usually tell students is what I usually tell faculty. And that's that any kind of change has a variety of different kinds of advocacy that may or may not be effective depending on the context. Sometimes change means getting the right leader in charge, right? Um, you know that you know that's not always the, the case when it comes to academia because of things like academic freedom, right? The right leader can't necessarily change anything if they can't herd the cats appropriately. Mm -hmm. um, but sometimes it's also about creating uh, energy and pressure and um, doing that through advocacy and protest. And so sometimes it's about ex organizing externally and making things happen through greater forces. For example, I don't think that most of the CS departments that are trying to seriously contemplate their um, engagement with ethics, which I think is, as an aside, a fairly narrow conception of what needs to be addressed here, that's not happening because everybody wants to do it. That's happening because the world is starting to think about computer science in problematic ways, right? There's pressure from the external world that's making that happen. There's pressure from the accreditation board. Pressure from accreditation, pressure from the public, pressure on all of the for-profit institutions that we tend to send our students to after they graduate, right? Those institutions are getting pressure politically. So it's that public pressure that's created a lot of this motivation. So in some ways you can argue that that's sort of the essential thing in computer science. Um, I don't know if chairs and deans have the power to do it. Um, I will say that I think full professors have the power to do it. So those of you with that title, just recognize that you do have that power to influence and change people and figure out what you wanna do with it, figure out how to use it. Um, I think what I'm trying to present here in this talk is a way of thinking about programming that doesn't discard the disciplinary perspectives on it, but deeply engages both the human, social and political parts of it that have always been there that we've just largely ignored. Thank you. We have a question in the chat. Bill, do you want to speak it or should I read it? Uh, sure. I, I'm, it's kind of, it's the other side looking outward and work I know you do in the CS for All movement. And it's so much driven by a corporate conversation uh, around code and a very simplistic notion of broadening participation in, into oppressive practices. How do we really shift? What are the leverage points you see in you know, really reshaping the CS for all movement. It's so important, uh, but it's it, it seems like it needs some reshaping. And then yeah. I know that the work that you're presenting with uh, your students, Stefania Druga, and we're doing some work too in the AI Institute around curriculum. So what do you see as the role of curriculum in that reshaping too? Yeah, there's a lot of um, powerful forces, let's say, that we have to sort of sort through and figure out how we navigate them. There's clearly corporate influence, right? Like, I got an email from Amazon Future Engineers um, from their, their corporate relations person this morning saying, hey, can you put a landing page on your CS for All Washington website that points everybody to this Amazon curriculum, right? <laughs> there's, a, there's a force there and every company has their curriculum and their platforms that they're pushing and trying to get into schools and I think that, that one question there is how to manage that um, volume of activity and money and pressure that comes from a corporate direction and how to make room for it alongside lots of other perspectives. It's not that we have to completely deny that um, companies have an interest in this too, but there has to be room for other ways of thinking about it as well. But there's other forces of power, right? There's things like, who are the teachers in the state or in the country that you're thinking about? Right? What are their values? What are their concerns? They're going to be a really central stakeholder in shaping what kinds of learning happens and how CS is framed to students. So that means going back to questions like um, not only uh, curriculum that they might choose from and PD they might take, but long term pre service and where how we how we prepare teachers um, to enter the profession and, and persist in it and stay in it. So we're launching um, a pre service program just this spring where we'll be graduating about 15 students a year. And we explicitly frame the program around these questions of uh, justice and oppression in CS. And that what, that, what that's done is really attracted um, people who want to be teachers who teach from that perspective. And so we'll have sort of um, a pathway here where we're graduating 15 new teachers a year. And who knows, within 20 years of doing this, at least in Washington State, 
a good proportion of the CS educators in K-12 could have that perspective. And that probably will make all kinds of change substantially easier. Um, that's just a 20 year effort. Yeah, one challenge will of course be retaining them in the teaching profession. Yeah, our bet around that is that there, there are lots of reasons why teachers don't stay that we, you know, a CS education effort isn't going to change the dynamics of, right? Salary, for example, um, uh, workload, um, lack of respect in this country. Um, other countries have different cultures around teachers. Those things are hard to change. But um, when we attract teachers to teaching in a profession with a broader mission, right? It's not just about a banking model of getting some knowledge about Java in some student's head, but rather teaching CS for the broader purpose of changing the changing society and changing justice in the world, I think that that provides a little bit more of a strong foundation of resilience towards persisting in the profession, seeing a reason to be there, seeing a community of people that are fighting for the same thing. That kind of support, as much as it doesn't fix the inherently broken structural parts of education, public education in the US, I think that it at least provides some structure around things that might encourage people to stay. Uh, Michael has a question. Yeah, so um, let me see how I can phrase this. My, my question is the role of assessment. So how that helps define how students view themselves as a programmer or software engineer. And um, I guess thinking about the objectivity that we often view of assessment of being right and wrong. So where can we go with assessment to better connect with students? So, um, or maybe like, what are issues with assessment and how they affect a student's interpretation of themselves as fitting in the role of software engineering? Yeah. Is that well stated? I feel like I've muddled through Sure. That. No, yeah. no, no, that's, that's okay. I know what you're going for and I'll, I'll probably just give it some slightly different language just to deepen that a bit. Um, fundamentally, uh, assessment as an idea is just knowing what people know, right? That's, that's, the, that's the broader intent of it. But when, when assessment becomes problematic is when we start applying it to contexts that go beyond that, that core mission, right? A teacher doing some formative assessment, for example, to understand what a particular student knows so that they can guide their um, instructional design, guide their assistance, guide their feedback, there's nothing inherently bad about that. That's all, that's all good. There's challenges around trying to scale it and challenges of trying to make sure the formative assessments are actually good diagnostic tools for doing that, um, that teaching work. It's when things get to be summative that things start falling apart, right? If an assessment determines whether or not a student gets a resource, whether they get to stay in college, whether or not they believe they belong, Right, it's those broader things that assessments have um, indirect consequences on that are the challenging and unfortunate parts. And there's sort of a weird um, uh, irony here too. Like, there's no summit of assessment really in the software industry. If you if you're talking about authenticity and belonging in in that particular domain, even though that's not the only domain that people need literacy around computing in. Nobody at Amazon and Microsoft and Google and a million other software startups are doing, you know, rigorous um, formative summative assessments of knowledge of their their employees. What they're doing is a lot of formative assessment. They're doing a lot of code reviews where somebody writes some code, does their best job that, that they can, and somebody sits down and reads it and provides a lot of feedback and guidance on how to improve it. And when um, it's improved and they've iterated a couple of times. Both of them have a better understanding of what somebody's skills and knowledge are. They've probably learned a lot in the process. They probably feel like they're part of the team and they're learning from mentors. That's the irony, right? There's this really beautiful, virtuous cycle of exchange that happens in industry in code reviews that just doesn't happen in um, formal education systems because we're so committed to these summative structures that we've constructed around it. So I, to me, that's sort of the direction we have to move. We just have to abandon some of the toxic kinds of summative assessment that we do and really commit to more formative ones. I mean, I think, like, got a sort of building on comment uh, for that. I think, anyway, I think this is great and uh, think a lot about assessment and its role. And in the, in the tech industry, right, if we're looking at that as a sort of authentic summative assessment or evaluation, right, to sort of move away from the summative 
I think summative assessment and formative assessment are so intertwined with one another because formative assessment dictates the expectations. So it's sort of hard to really un like detangle the two, but if we're looking at it as evaluation, like how are you evaluated? Sometimes we see plenty of instances of people in the technology industry who are fired or canceled because they're pushing back against some of these power structures, some of the neoliberal and sort of oppressive structures of these companies. So I think there's also a tension here where some of the ways that people in the workplace are evaluated are um, because they're not conforming. And so anyway, it just makes me think about sort of how the, the industry is driving this conformity as a, an evaluation metric. Uh, and that then they also have roles in the standards and how the standards are developed. And then that trickles down to how teachers are evaluated. So. Anyway, yeah, just made me think of yeah. that there's this interesting nuance there. Let me go ahead and stop my slides for now, just so we can have a bit more of a conversation. Um, in an interesting way, there is a valuation in industry that, that results in some of this really sometimes racist and sexist kind of retaliation against employees. But I don't know that it's often part of the formal evaluation criteria. That's the interesting paradox, right? What it is, is sort of unstated hidden curriculum about how you're supposed to behave. And, and the rules are usually, right, if you're at Google, don't rock the boat around these topics, otherwise you're fired, right? That's an example from the last year that we can kind of poke at. Um, and that's true for lots of companies, right? Don't create conflict, uh, otherwise you're out. Don't make us look bad, otherwise you're out. So those are actually part of the, the sort of annual reviews that people went through. <laughs> Um, I think you'd see different consequences to sort of the review, the review process. People would start complaining about it. They'd start um, doing more uprising around just the evaluation kinds of criteria that they have. Um, well, and, and it's also interesting because they're scholars in your position or my position. I feel like we're expected to rock the boat. And that is part of how we're evaluated and yeah. novel contributions to the field. Like if I'm ever gonna get tenure, I, I should be establishing that I'm disrupting things in a certain way and providing novel contributions. So it's interesting that there's sort of in academia, it can go the other way too. Well, then we have to kind of disaggregate the parts of academia, right? In research, that's absolutely the case, but in teaching, it's often not in higher education. And we certainly communicate to students that it's, all, it's not either. Like the message often in CS to students is, I'm the person with the right answers. You're the person who has to figure them out. And here are the resources that I'm gonna give you to help learn them. Not question the way that I've framed what computer science is, question the way that I've um, contextualized this assignment, question my choices pedagogically because maybe they aren't great for you, right? That's not usually the message that students get. Now we've scared away all the other questions. <laughs> you can ask lower level ones too, if you want. Go ahead, Michael. Yeah, I'll, I'll tack in another question then. Um, so a lot of my research is in looking at debugging for physical computing and supporting students in that setup. I feel like part of the issue with the literature is often we're looking at debugging as a solo activity. So we're looking at the student just finding the error, or supporting the student like on their own, not with peers or with the instructor. Um, so I think like, how do we bring this idea of culture and community into the debugging process? Yeah. And looking at it as a peer thing rather than a solo thing. Yeah, yeah, there's a really interesting tension at the heart of that too, right? Because of what a lot of my work would suggest about debugging and program understanding is that ultimately the answers are in the program and how it executes, that's where the answer is. And so like, it's not that the social um, strategies you might deploy to try to understand um, the cause of some failure are necessary. They're, they're an option amongst many others, right? You can do it alone, you can do it with other people, you can search the internet. There's just many ways that you might try to accelerate that search process and be more successful at finding the underlying cause of some problem. And even further, I think my results show that the more attention you can give, um, that you can get students to place on understanding precisely what a program is doing, the more successful they're going to be. 
And in some ways that is a solitary activity because it's them building a mental model in their mind of exactly what the program is doing. So I think that um, the more nuanced way of thinking about the social parts of debugging are how do you simultaneously get somebody's attention on the code and its execution and on building that model in their mind to comprehend it, but at the same time, build resilience and persistence around that through social means, um, doing some of the kinds of um, problem solving collaboratively, right? Can you help me brainstorm possible things to look at? Doing some of the information seeking around um, how do I understand what this API call is doing collaboratively so that other people can help share in some of the labor of understanding the behavior of the program, right? So it's about making the right things social, but also recognizing that ultimately there's got to be a model in their head of what the machine is doing so that they can comprehend what fix to make. Somebody started tearing down a fence outside my window. So apologies if there's a noise. Karen? Hi, I wanted to ask how much of this you think is unique to sort of the, the like learning of programming and how much of it could sort of broadly apply to the way we teach like engineering skills and other STEM fields that are sort of highly biased in, in gender. Yeah, yeah, this is a really important question and sort of classic for any discipline-based education research that happens, right? Like what are the boundaries around the discipline and, and, and so on. I think that the things that are unique here to programming are the things that concern the medium of code, mm -hmm. right? The, the way that code um, relies heavily on structure and logic and reasoning about structure and logic. Um, those are things that are not always present in other disciplines in the same way. Uh, the way that the discipline relies on notations, for example, and comprehending notations um, that are not just a community-wide accepted notation like mathematics, for example, but a constantly evolving set of notations that are often combined together and used in creative new ways and discarded and replaced. And so there's a lot of things like that in computing that are actually are pretty unique, I think, to the discipline. Other stuff, you know, probably isn't unique at all. Like Self-regulation probably matters everywhere. <laughs> and it's always important for all kinds of problem solving in all kinds of disciplines. It's probably also the case that people struggle to do it in, in all disciplines in different ways. And that some of the strategies that we might, might have for promoting it might be similarly reusable across lots of disciplines. Um, I think the value in doing disciplinary centered work in this partly is to try to understand really deeply when those more general understandings fail because of context, right? And then trying to identify in the specific um, disciplinary contexts, what's necessary to do in that discipline to account for context, right? The tools of programming, for example, are just dramatically different than the tools of mechanical engineering. And so um, I guess that's not true as much anymore. Things are slowly all becoming computing, but um, I guess that's just an even greater argument for focusing on computing. <laughs> Are there any final questions for Amy today? Can I ask one more? I feel like I'm hogging all the time, but it's kind of related to Kieran's question. In that, you know, how we teach the, the programming and stuff, one of the interesting aspects is it's almost all in English. Well, we discuss programming of Java and Python as its own language, if in for loop and all of this is in English. Um, so how do you think about how we teach coding affects, you know, individuals who like English isn't their primary language. So how do we also support this gap in language understanding? Yeah. In the abstract, right, that's just a patently exclusionary choice that mm -hmm. most communities make when they're building resources for, for learning programming, for doing programming. APIs get some documentation and it's always released in English first and maybe in one other language 10 years mm -hmm. later, right? And on the other hand, there's a broader global context of this in that many people, if you look at studies, for example, of students learning to code in India, um, they see huge amount of um, economic opportunity in learning English and learning to code by learning in English is actually a mutually beneficial and reinforcing activity, right? They want to learn English and they want to learn to code. Both of them will help them economically. 
And so it's not but that it's not desired and that they prefer a world in which everything else was um, in one of the many Indian dialects. So there's a really hard choice to make there, I think, from a design perspective, right? If you're designing a new language or designing resources or designing curriculum, um, what does it mean to be culturally responsive when oftentimes the cultures you're trying to respond to want you to reinforce the hegemony? at least for their own particular needs, right? Their own individual needs, even if the macro scale ones get ignored. Sorry, no answers on that one. <laughs> Thanks for continuing the conversation though. No, that was cool. Sort of speaking to the, those like sort of reinforcing kind of practices, how much do you anticipate resistance to the kind of change that you want to see? I don't have to anticipate it. Um, I get lots of hate mail and I get some death threats too. So there are people that are angry. They, they don't like it when trans people ask for change. So I expect a lot and I get a lot and I'm sure that releasing this book will result in even more of it. Anytime I talk about race, for example, I just get a lot of angry emails from CS faculty telling me to stop talking. So um, I think that part of advocacy is just recognizing that that's the work that it takes to make change, is dealing with people who don't want it to happen. And just kind of bracing yourself and making sure you have lots of community support while you do it and taking a break when it gets too exhausting. Thank you. Well, speaking of breaks, oh, Arish has one more question. Let's do it. Okay, so uh, thank you so much for this wonderful talk, really. Uh, I've been learning a lot uh, from reading you. Uh, so it's been really a pleasure. Uh, I have a question about uh, the work with children uh, around the, specifically the perceptions and the, how, how did you make like the, I would say, how did you do the assessment for perceptions change in that context? And uh, uh, yeah, especially around the, not just their in engagement with the uh, C CS, but also the values and ethics around their engagement with it. Yeah, yeah, let's talk about the sort of intel machine intelligence perception first, and then we can talk about the values and ethics piece. Both of them are really interesting and challenging measurement questions, right? Especially when you're dealing with children. So when we were talking to um, what were mostly nine and 10 year olds um, about machine intelligence and perception, oftentimes it's about finding really simple language and really open-ended prompts that um, just elicit their, their perspectives on things from a, um, from a natural language perspective. And so we would say things like, um, here's a device, right? Here's an Alexa or something like that. And um, they would play with it. And then we would ask them questions like, what else do you think it can do, right? Pre, they would imagine all of these other capabilities, just this full, rich, artificially intelligent, fully expressed vision of strong AI. And then post after having to build some things um, with it, right? They would say, yeah, mostly it can't do anything. It can really only do what I can teach it. And I can't really teach it to do anything. So it probably just can't do much at all, right? It would just swing wildly back um, based on that really grounded experience with trying to make with it. Um, and so really simple prompts like that were pretty effective at just getting them to say many, many things about their opinions. We also did it in collaborative contexts where they were in group settings. And so that complicates measurement a little bit, but really promotes a lot more sharing because one student would share one belief and then another student would react and say, I don't think that, I think this other thing. And so it creates a lot of energy and um, generates a lot more uh, sharing in, in the process. And then you just have to manage sort of making sure that the quieter students have an opportunity to share their opinions too by having other channels for them to share. So we would have them write it on post-it notes and put it on a little poster while the others were arguing. Um, in terms of ethics and values and all of those things, um, we have a paper coming out at the um, SIGSI Technical Symposium um, in this March, and we talk more about that. It turned out that it took us a solid five or six weeks to develop enough trust with students to have um, the occasion to talk to them about these issues. They needed to trust that they, that they could trust us to have conversations about 
justice and oppression in ways that didn't harm them, in ways that didn't further oppress them. And so pedagogically, it was really a challenging um, teaching motion to try to build that community of trust in a broader context that they didn't really have a lot of trust for before we could really open up the space to have those conversations about values and ethics. Once we did though, right, you, you cannot imagine how many opinions um, high schoolers have about all of these issues that they just have no context to share them in. They don't even talk to their parents or friends about it because everything seems like a scary context for sharing. So that's, that was the really powerful thing we learned there. Thank you so much. Just reading this question from Susan. Oh, coding versus programming. If you want to know the history of how coding caught on, it's because one day Hadi Partovi was outside in his driveway um, around here in, um, in, in the Puget Sound. And his neighbor happens to be um, the, uh, the president of Microsoft uh, who, um, and just, he was talking to him about his, his ideas around trying to um, bring computer science to the public through code.org and um, he decided to make a $10 million donation to Hadi and that's what founded code.org. And when they were found in code.org, um, they could buy the domain code.org um, programming.org wasn't available. <laughs> and so, so they had enough money to get code.org, which is just kind of an astounding reason. So then they just made it hour of code. And that's when, um, that's when that word caught on. So I don't really have opinions about it. I mean, it's, it's fine. It's, it's a strange, um, dichotomy. They're not, they don't really mean different things to me, but certainly coding is the one that, that won. Money can buy lots of things. Um, Money bought language in that case, yes. <laughs> well, thank you so much for that terrific talk, Amy, and for joining us on the Friday for what for us is fall break next week. Oh, I, lucky you. Yeah, I hope you get some time next week to take uh, to relax. Uh, but I just want to remind everyone else that yes, we have next week off. There are no classes. Be sure to take some time and regenerate and recharge and come back uh, invigorated for the remainder of the year. Thanks, everybody. Thank you, Amy. Thank you, Amy. That was really informative. I'm I'm less um, knowledgeable about this than many of the others that were here. I understood what you were talking about, and um, and have enough people in my family who are doing coding that I recognized a lot of the issues. Great, thanks, Jane. I saw you recorded. Is that recording going to be posted somewhere? Yes, it's uh, up to you, Amy. Um, basically, we record it as a courtesy to um, our topic students who may mm. not all be able to attend. We have a one semester, uh, one semester, one unit course where um, they read the paper that you sent, they attend the talk or listen to your recording. And as you will see in a little over a week, they then generate further questions for the speaker, which I will collate and send to you the week after Thanksgiving. Great. And you are under no obligation to answer them. They're really, you know, it's just motivating for the students to know that their questions will be sent to the, to the speakers. That makes sense. Yeah, I'm happy it's, if it's posted and if you want to just, if you share the recording with me too, I, I always post my talks if I have recordings of them too. So okay. thank that'd you. That'd be great. All, All right. right. Thank you so thank much. You. Thank you, Amy. Have a good break.